now more important than ever. I am Brenda Siegel, I'm running for Lieutenant Governor, and I am here with Emily Thompson from Sunrise Middlebury, Zariah Hightower, who's a Chittenden County, sorry, a Burlington City Councilor, Tanya Biahofsky, who is running for State House in Chittenden 8-1, and David Glittersdorf from All Earth Renewables, and with, who comes with a long time of uh, work in the renewable energy industry. And so we're really excited to have this conversation because right now it's more important than ever to move forward with global climate action. Uh, we see some signs that people want to dial it back because of the economic crisis, and then we have this conversation and so we're here to talk to you all about that. We're going to have brief introductions from each person, and then we will get deeper into the conversation. I just want to let folks know, if you're on and watching, that you can interact in the chat box. You can interact with a Q&A. And if you have a question and you want to ask it live, we'll likely be able to bring you up. It may take a little while until we get to those questions. If you're watching on anywhere but Progressive Insiders YouTube, or our Facebook Live, uh, we are not monitoring those questions. So, or coming in to this event, we are not monitoring those questions. So please do either enter the event so that you can actually ask us live or ask us in the chat or go to Facebook Live on the Brenda Siegel for Vermont page on Facebook or to uh, Progressive Insiders YouTube uh, and any one of those will be monitored for questions. The reason you can't actually interact right now, for those of you that don't know, is because we have you, um, we have panelists up and the others are, are in an attendee box. And we will bring you up to ask the question live if you, if you have one and it will be later when we ask you about questions, but please do type in questions as they come right now. Okay, now that we've got that administrative work going, uh, I am ready to, I'm gonna introduce Emily Thompson from Sunrise Middlebury. Hi, thank you for that. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Emily Thompson. I am a sophomore at Middlebury College and I am political co-coordinator of Sunrise Middlebury, which is a hub of the national Sunrise movement. Um, I just wanted to briefly talk about why I got involved in Sunrise and how I got involved because I think it speaks a lot to Sunrise's theory of change um, and how it can be such a source of hope for us in this time of crisis. Um, I honestly didn't care much about the climate crisis for the majority of my life. I'm 20, so that's not a particularly long time, but um, yeah, it took till the end of high school to really take the crisis seriously. Um, and even then I still didn't change much about how I conducted my life. And then I came to college and kind of dabbled, but really didn't, um, did never commit myself to really doing everything I could um, for this, this fight. And then someone who eventually became my friend one day approached me and said, I'm going to DC, I'm getting in a van, I'm gonna protest Congress and we're gonna get a Green New Deal. And I hardly knew anything about the Green New Deal. I hardly knew this person. Um, and it was the weekend before finals week. <laughs> um, but I took the leap because I had to ask myself in that moment, Emily, are you gonna do everything you can? Are you gonna be able to say at the end of the day that you did everything you could to fight for this thing that you believe in? So I did it. It was one of the best decisions I made. I show up at DC to this church and there are almost a thousand young people there who are singing and chanting and telling stories about this vision of how we can combine social justice with, um, with how we solve this environmental crisis. And from that moment, I've been hooked and haven't stopped fighting since. So yeah, now I'm political co-coordinator of Sunrise Middlebury, fighting for a Green Mountain New Deal um, and fighting for, yeah, not only, you know, decarbonizing our economy rapidly, but making sure that we're taking care of workers, that we're taking care of frontline and marginalized communities in the process and not only taking care of them, because gosh, that sounded so uh, uh, patronizing, but like empowering them and making sure that they're the ones calling the shots as, uh, as we're working through this crisis. So yeah, thank you all so much for having me. Thank you so much, Emily, and thanks for joining us. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce Tanya Viehovsky. Hi, thanks, Brenda. I'm Tanya Viehovsky, and I am, as Brenda said, running for state representative in Chittenden 81. And I am here for a host of reasons. And one of the reasons, Emily, you sort of spoke to is I think a lot of times 
social justice issues and climate justice issues get pitted against each other. And the reality is, is that climate justice is social justice. And I think that I have seen so much hope in breaking down those silos and really coming together on climate justice because so frequent, I'm a social worker by trade. And so frequently I see people think that this isn't my fight because I'm low income or this isn't my fight because I've got these other things. And the reality is, is this is all of our fight. And one place I've really seen people come together is, is on climate justice. And I believe deeply that we have to fight for a sustainable green economy that isn't built on the backs of the most vulnerable. And the Green New Deal really spoke to that for me. It really spoke to a just, sustainable green economy that lifted us all up. And that brings me to fight with everything I have for saving our planet and lifting everyone up so that we can all take part in a, in a just economy. Thanks, Tanya, and thanks for joining us. Uh, and uh, Tanya, I just want to say uh, that Tanya is also a candidate, and so we're also going to put her donation link up right now so that you can contribute to her and help her win this race because we need people, climate fighters in the legislature. Uh, I'm going to kick it over to Zariah now. Hi, Brenda, and thanks for having me. Um, I come to the climate fight by way of being an environmentalist. I started um, as kind of an economist, environment policy person, then in grad school, pivoted more to environmental management. And I think I saw a lot of, oh, bye, hi, I'm Zora Hightower. I'm city councilor for Burlington. Um, moved to Burlington four years ago. Um, but in grad school, I think I saw that there were a lot of debates being had over, is the price of climate $30, is it $35? And then talking more about communication. And I think, that it became more and more evident to me both at grad school and afterwards that it's really the systems that we have in place that are stopping any action on climate change. It's not that we don't understand the science. It's not that we're still learning more about the science or learning more about the cost because those are nuances in the debate that we're still very, very much losing. And so um, I'm excited about um, us really taking action on a broader level in terms of environmental policy, but also in terms of behavior change um, and really coming together, not just as a country, but really as a globe, but also as cities, as communities to um, put in changes to our entire system that really will make radical change. And um, yeah, that's why I'm here. I'm kind of an environmentalist by trade and then very much came into the social aspect of environmental justice and climate justice um, in the past few years. Well, I really love hearing how everybody came to this. Uh, we, on other panels we've had, people haven't necessarily brought that in and I'm really, I'm really enjoying hearing that. Uh, now I'd love to introduce, thanks Zariah, and I'd love to introduce David Glittersdorf, who I had an incredible conversation with yesterday along with your partner, Deb Sachs. I have, uh, learned so much in the last few days uh, and as someone who has been interested in this subject and learning about it all along I mean especially doing some deep dives uh, in the last year or so uh, even more I am just blown away by what I've learned in the last couple of days in these conversations so thank you and please introduce yourself hi everybody um, I'm I'm a Vermonter. I was born in Proctor, Vermont, and grew up in Pittsford near Rutland. And um, my my history goes all the way back to being a, a, a 12 year old uh, growing up uh, in Pittsford, and became enthused about wind power when I learned about the Grandpa's Knob wind turbine that was built in the late 30s and early 40s, uh, just over the ridge. Uh, and it was the first large wind turbine to ever put power into the utility grid. And so and that was 1969, a year before Earth Day. And since that, as a 12 year old, I said, I do not like fossil fuels. And at the time a Vermont Yankee was being constructed. And I said, nuclear power, uh, even, even as a 12 year old kid, I figured out this isn't gonna work. This is a bad thing. So, I graduated from uh, UVM uh, with a mechanical engineering degree. So I have a technical side of things. And uh, growing up with uh, 
a family. My mom and dad both had their own businesses. It was natural. Uh, I had to go and do my own business because I was a real pain in the butt employee. Um, so I wanted to do things myself. So a year out of UVM, I started NRG Systems out of a rented house in Bristol, Vermont. And NRG from 82 to today uh, became the world's leading company to measure the wind. And that's what I did for a lot of years. Uh, uh, recently, I've switched to uh, building wind farms um, and um, building uh, solar products. So by profession, I'm a, a, a marketer, a big picture thinker, uh, and uh, an engineer. So almost 40 years of experience, um, and here we are uh, re really at a crossroads, and um, we're, we, we have a bunch of things to do. I spent 40 years in renewables, and we're finally getting to the point where uh, renewables can do what it was always promised to do. Uh, my first trade show in 1982 in Amarillo, Texas, there was 200 of us wind people, and now there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in wind energy. Um, so we've come a long ways with technology and how this all works. So that's what I'm bringing to this discussion, uh, a, a big picture view of all energy because I've had to compete against the oil and the gas and the coal and nuclear power uh, in my businesses. So, um, you know, hopefully we can have a great discussion tonight. Thank you. And I'm Brenda Siegel. And again, I'm running for Lieutenant Governor. And I live in Southern Vermont, right near Vermont Yankee. And I really came uh, to the climate fight uh, in nuclear power in as it is pertains to Vermont Yankee. Uh, when you are being uh, passed out potassium iodine pills as something that you need to keep in your home, uh, you are actually thinking, uh, I think <laughs> quite a lot about what that means. Uh, and also uh, my grandfather had written the a screenplay about uh, the a Chernobyl. And it was, and I, I really didn't at that time, it was, I was quite young. I didn't at that time have a real understanding of, of what those plants, what, were, what was possible from those plants and how much disaster they could cause to our environment and to animals and to us and even future generations. Uh, and so uh, really learning a lot from that. He actually went and visited the plant and, he would talk to us about it a lot. He was a big social justice warrior. Uh, and I ended up entrenched a little bit in the fight for Vermont Yankee to close and was very glad when it did finally close. Uh, and then really have been taking the lead on uh, the fight for climate change from uh, young people and young adults uh, in a lot of ways and combining that with research and knowledge from older adults and really figuring out how to connect that together to find a way to move forward. But I also, as I look at climate energy plans, I often uh, do think we leave out the social justice aspect and how it impacts uh, marginalized communities, climate change. My own experience with it being that I lost everything in Tropical Storm Irene, and then a couple of years later was hearing a governor tell me, that, uh, that climate change was gonna be a boon for our economy. And, uh, and I felt pretty offended by that because it was certainly not a boon for my personal economy. It, was, it changed everything. Uh, and, and as someone who could not myself just get out of that, um, I, it, was a, it was a big change and it was, and it was a big eye opener as well and that's back in 2011. So uh, since then I have really tried to lift up the fight of our young people, talk openly about how important it is to continue those rallies and those arguments along with those conversations and the negotiating with legislators along with the disruption in the legislature, like all of those things are part of the picture for us bringing this change about and I want to uh, hold all of those as important. But I also want us to talk about the science and I also want us to talk about what we need to do to be successful in this fight. So uh, that's where we can start this conversation. And I'd actually love it uh, if 
David, if you don't mind starting us off with a more comprehensive, a little bit more comprehensive discussion from uh, where you stand and then actually Zariah, because both of you working in this field, I think I'd love to hear, start there. Okay. Um, well, let, let's go to the biggest picture. Uh, we're, we're right in the middle of this uh, pandemic crisis um, and a bunch of things are happening that uh, a number of us have seen coming for decades. Uh, the, the crash in oil prices uh, is a, a flush out of the financial system doing bad investments in fracking companies. Uh, they're all gonna go bankrupt because the price of oil just crashed uh, to negative numbers. Um, so they're producing too much oil and we have about a 30% decrease in oil usage that just happened over the last couple months. Um, and, and that is a big thing. Uh, we, we have an intersection in this time of we, we've basically lived on these fossil fuels and we think or we have thought that they will last forever. Uh, they're finite. Uh, they don't last forever. Uh, we were supposed to peak in worldwide oil production around 2005. Uh, we were on track to do it, but the frackers figured out uh, in 08 how to borrow cheap money from Wall Street. And uh, now that's coming due and Wall Street will no longer invest in fracked oil and gas uh, because uh, they can't meet even operating expenses. Uh, so, but they're sort of stuck that they have to keep producing to even get any cash. So, but th this is a big deal. The stocks of the fracking companies are going down tremendously, ExxonMobil, Chevron, they're all crashing for a reason. These guys had the upper hand for a long time because oil has been 40% of our energy worldwide. Uh, natural gas, about another 20%, coal, another 20%. And then the rest of the sources, wind, solar, biomass, were the other uh, 10%, basically, uh, or 20% in the world. So we're, we're at a crossroads. And... Um, you know, it, it's kind of strange for me after 40 years in this business of rolling that big, heavy rock up a mountain, but it just went over the top of the mountain and it is coming down the other side fast. And we as a society are going to have to wake up and do something totally different than we've been used to. So I look at all this. I look at Vermont. Vermont has the potential to be renewably powered by electrifying our energy system. But right now we still import 90% of our energy, mostly uh, oil and gas um, and a little coal, uh, but we are not self-sufficient at all, but we're small enough. We have a low population and enough land area to do this. Most other states don't, unless you're a big state like uh, in the Midwest that has tremendous wind resources and land uh, but most states that have a high populous, population, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, uh, can't produce the renewables uh, to replace all the fossil fuels. So one thing to remember is, uh, I don't know if some of you might have seen Michael Moore's sponsored new movie. Um, that movie is a, basically a lie. But they had one thing right, that we cannot replace all the fossil fuels we're using with renewables, what we can do is probably replace 20% um, or so. I use the number of, there's enough resources to build wind and solar and hydro and some a few other things, not biofuels, to uh, do that in this world. But we're not gonna do 100% replacement. Uh, we will do about a 20% replacement. So what that tells us that we have to reduce energy use by 80%. And you're gonna have to do that anyways to get rid of uh, uh, carbon emissions. So you need to reduce this. But this, uh, we humans won't do that voluntarily. Um, so this crisis is a, a, a real kick in the pants to change our lifestyle from consumerism and uh, uh, everything that we uh, want and we're gonna to have to go back to taking care of our needs, not our wants. Um, and uh, so we have a whole new world 
uh, that we will see shortly. And this is a turning point uh, that that uh, I think we're we're going through. So it's going to take all of us to make sure this thing turns around really quickly. Thank you, and I and I am going to note that I appreciate that Tanya's dog is trying to be part of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, Tanya's dog is pretty much always part of the conversation, so that makes sense to me. Uh, so I wanted to now. Uh, I uh, have Zariah talk. And then I think before we all introduce a little bit more about our thoughts, I'm gonna have some questions since Zariah is only here for our first hour. Um, and that way we can break it up uh, the way that we're asking questions. Yeah, thanks Brenda. So um, I think the question was around like facts and what we know. And I mean, I think probably everyone who's listening to it knows some of the biggest facts that you know, our CO2 concentration is the highest it's been in 3 million years, that 17 of the 18 warmest years on record have been in the last 20 years. Um, I mean, I think the fact that this is a crisis is just not a debatable fact. Um, some of the things we're still trying to figure out is how much we can save, what it looks like to save it, how much can we do from renewables, um, and what the impact is going to be. And I think to me, that last part is really the scariest and where social justice really comes into it because it is not a question that social, uh, that climate change is going to affect um, the kind of poorest people and the most vulnerable people first. And um, for those of us that think that that is just the way of the world and um, has generally been working and that that's really unacceptable, that's scary because it's a like it's the world is already so set up to reward some and um, just make it really hard for others that having this looming crisis that's just going to continue to make this worse and worse, similar to the way COVID has, um, is just really, really hard to see. And so I think we're still doing a lot of research on what exactly that looks like. Um, and that is something that we're gonna continue to have to fund a lot and to understand one of the, I worked with an East African climate data organization um, who was, uh, they were all, they were mostly men, they were all African and they were trying to figure out how they could do a better job of just communicating the data that they had because they know that every time there's a drought, if they don't predict it two months ahead of time, that creates a huge impact um, in terms of what that means on the ground. And that is something that is just to answer some of the questions that we need to, that we do still need to answer about climate change, which has nothing to do with whether or not it's happening and that it's gonna be bad, but with like who it's gonna impact and when, we need to spend more time and more money understanding those the same way that we have been doing with COVID. It's like, if you want the resource, if you have the, resources and you dedicate them, um, it very quickly becomes very obvious what some of the right answers are. And it's not perfect. And I think something that we've seen, sorry, I'm ready to kind of, kind of go into something that we've seen with COVID is if you, it's better to try something and then to subtly change it than to not try anything at all, because then we're never going to know. And that's how we've been dealing with the climate crisis to be like, well, we don't have the perfect solution. So we're going to implement very few of the solutions that we have. And that's, obviously just not the right way to go about it. And I think is a lack of empathy um, that, that I think, and it's clear that the world has empathy based on where we are in the world right now. Um, now that we're all dealing with this very global crisis, um, it's been amazing how much empathy we have for the most vulnerable um, and our neighbors and everyone else. And I think we can apply that attitude towards climate as well. So thanks so much. And uh, those two perspectives are really strong and powerful. If you have questions, please ask them in the chat. I just want to say that um, I think that sometimes we think we talk about the cost of what it will cost to actually do this work, but we don't talk about uh, what it costs for us not to. So that's really convenient um, and generally a very conservative messaging that we've now bought into on the left where we start doing it too. And I think we have to begin to do better in the way that we talk about uh, the cost of not doing it and uh, both economically and, uh, and morally. But I do think that there are those people that when you talk to them, 
it has to be on the economic front. And then there are those other people that when you're talking to them, it has to be on uh, both. But we spent an astronomical, I mean, how expensive was Tropical Storm Irene, really? So we spent an astronomical amount of money and same with COVID. I mean, when we look at COVID, the preparation that we could have had by having a paid family and medical leave program or by having a higher livable wage or by having higher wages in general in Vermont or all these things that the second, like a one week of not having work in Vermont and the, our entire economy was gonna collapse. I mean, it was the second in, across the country, it was the second that it happened. And so I think that sometimes when we're talking about this, understanding that we're not building a firm or solid structure we're building a structure that will collapse and so if we want to build better we have to we have to do better in in the way that we discuss this as well uh, and we have a question from ann zimmerman we can bring her up so that she can come in and, and ask the question live if she's if she's okay with that i'm gonna say i'm gonna just say she is so let's bring her in I hope. <laughs> oh, there she is. And you can turn on your camera and your mic and ask the question. Or you can not turn your camera and just your, you can just turn on your mic. <laughs> you you might be muted. You might think you're not, but you're muted. me again okay, but, um, I I actually did not have a question and I'm concerned that maybe somebody else did and you have me as somebody else in your it said yeah. next to your name your right hand was raised oh interesting oh yeah. okay <laughs> <laughs> I have been eating dinner and my cats have been walking on my computer <laughs> Okay, well, it was exciting to have a question. You sure you don't have one? I really like Zoom meetings. They do. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we'll I will raise my hand if I have one, though. Thank you for... Okay. We'll, we'll put you back now. <laughs> um, so anyways, uh, while we don't have any questions, it looks like yet, then, then I'm going to uh, go on and let Emily talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about the work that they do at Sunrise and the vision that they have. And if you are, do you think of questions, please feel free to ask them. Cause again, Zariah will have to leave um, in about 25 minutes. And so we wanna make sure you have time to ask her questions um, as well. Go ahead, Emily. Thanks. So yeah, uh, Sunrise Movement, we're a hub of the national movement. So we work on both state level stuff, trying to get a Green Mountain New Deal here in the state and trying to get really progressive Green Mountain New Deal champions elected uh, amongst other things. Uh, but we also push for national policies as well, pressuring our national politicians. We're pretty fortunate here in Vermont when, uh, when it comes to our federally rec uh, elected representatives. But um, yeah, I think Sunrise, the idea behind Sunrise and why I really gravitated towards this movement is it's youth led. So, you know, all the founders were under 30 years old when they started it. And they started it because they realized that we didn't get a say. We just showed up. We didn't really get a say what was going to happen in this world. Um, and some of us are too young to even vote. Uh, for people in office who will make the changes that are necessary for this world. The climate crisis is not simply a technological problem that needs to be fixed. It's a social problem, it's a cultural problem, and it's a political problem. It's the fact that uh, m that power has been consolidated in the hands of very few people, and Sunrise is kind of, um, it's a way in which youth can reclaim our power and we can, you know, lobby our officials, we can sit in their offices, we can, you know, knock down their doors, not, not knock down them, but um, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and yeah, and really claim it back and get people in office who are actually going to fight um, for the livable future that we all need. And it's not just youth. Um, and we're seeing this through COVID right now. Um, there's been a coalition of uh, social and environmental justice organizations fighting for a people's bailout, which is um, similar to, honestly, pretty similar to the Green New Deal and that it's fighting for um, 
you know, putting people over profits over big corporations right now um, and making sure that we are putting in place a regenerative economy and that we're putting um, jobs in uh, on the market that will actually benefit our lives and make our lives better when it comes to caretakers and making sure that we have um, stable food systems. And so, yeah, that's kind of what we're fighting for. And we're building up coalitions. This isn't like a sunrise only thing. And I don't think Sunrise has ever seen themselves as like the leader, the face of all climate and social justice change, but rather that um, we need not only a climate movement, a solid climate movement, but we need climate movements in solidarity with labor, in solidarity with racial justice, in solidarity with indigenous rights, and we need indigenous leadership at the front lines of this as well. And I think some rights could do a little bit better with that last bit, um, but I think that we've seen really good work um, when they would show up. Uh, a while back there were protests um, in the Midwest against Pipeline and some rights really showed up for that. And I think um, in general, that's that's a really strong um, sentiment that some rights has. So I think yeah, we see all these problems as interconnected and we know that we can't do it alone and we know that we need to amass people power and that once we build that up, we can consult, not consolidate, but we can spread the political power necessary to create this change. I don't know if that answered your question or if that got too rambly, but. No, that was excellent, Emily. I often feel like I'm rambling. Sometimes I am probably and sometimes I'm not. Uh, so, Tanya, we don't, I don't see any questions yet, but if there are any on Facebook, Jacob, just let us know in the chat and then we'll, we'll bring you up to ask that. Uh, so, uh, by the way, when I refer to Jacob for those of the panelists, that's my field director. So, uh, yeah. So Tanya, I'd love to hear a little bit about what you've been doing and your leadership at Rights and Democracy and also uh, kind of the direction that you feel like we need to head in, in the legislature in Vermont. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. So, um, Emily, you brought up the people's bailout and I actually moderated a town hall yesterday um, on a Vermont people's bailout because we really are talking about, lift, as I said, lifting everyone up. Our economy for too long has been built on the false idea that trickle down is going to somehow do something other than line the pockets of people who have more than they'll ever need. And we've seen, you know, 40 years of neoliberal policy that has exploited our planet and has exploited workers and has really just turned millionaires into billionaires and the working class into the working poor. And we've got to shift in a way that really lifts people up. And so I have been working as a member leader with rights and democracy on many fronts because the reality is, is all of these things are interconnected. You know, when we talk about a global Green New Deal package, what we're talking about is workers' rights and healthcare rights and indigenous rights and racial justice. And we're really talking about building a global package that ensures that everyone's basic human rights are met and fought for. And so on that front, I too have, you know, I have, I've been to protests and I have spoken at the state house and I have testified in spaces to really say that we are strongest together. And if we are able to put power back in the hands of the people and truly have a people's democracy where people, where it is of, for, and by the people, that we can build transformative structural change that no one of us could ever build alone because we are bringing diverse voices to the table and we're really bringing the voices of the unheard. I, I sit in Vermont a lot of times and I, I hear our legislators and I hear people in leadership positions scratching their head wondering, you know, how do we keep young people here and how do we do all these things? And the reality of it is, is we have to shift the conversation and bring young people and you know, people of color to the table and ask them what is going to keep you here and what is going to bring you here. And when I think about it, you know, we have this all I, I think a lot of times we all feel very lucky that we live in Vermont and, you know, I look out my window and I'm looking at trees and green and it can be this, this l sort of false sense of security that things are okay when the reality is, is that things are not okay and we have to support our communities, you know, and part of the reason that I fight for the things that I fight for is because we need an expedient and just transition in collaboration with unions and working Vermonters and indigenous communities. And that needs to include reparation for those that have been harmed by environmental racism and those that have been harmed, been harmed by environmental colonialism. And, we live in a state, it's one of the poorest, it is, I believe, the poorest state in New England. And 
our working families are stressed enough. They can't afford to be the ones to foot the bill for these changes. And so we have to stop offering their tax money to pay for new fossil fuel infrastructure. We have to tax those that have, because I don't believe taxes are a dirty word. I believe that taxes are something we have to pay to have a just community, but I want to ensure that those taxes are going to build that just community and not line the stock portfolios of polluters and, and people who have every break given to them at the federal and the state level in many cases. You know, So it's interesting to me to take those challenges and have people look at me and say, well, I just don't know what we can do, when the reality is, is that in many instances, they're just not listening to what people are screaming for. And that is solidarity and that is fighting for a green just workforce that ensures people have health care and ensures people have livable wages and paid family leave and are trained to exist in a green sustainable economy that would incentivize young people to stay and work here yeah and on that front tanya i want to just say that i um Tanya and I have been working with a group of progressive candidates all across the country who all support a Green New Deal and moving forward with a green economy. Uh, and you'll hear more about that later this week, but we've been uh, really realizing and always have known that we're just stronger if we're all working together and we have more power that way. And so we need to lift as we rise is what I say a lot. And I think that it's extremely important that we are thinking about that when we're thinking about how we transition into a just green economy. And coming out of COVID-19, I don't know what out of means, this is going to be going on for a very long time, but coming out of it, we really have to think about how we're going to move forward and what does a green economy, what part is that going to play in uh, both the economic recovery and also what we need to do for climate change. Uh, and what what does that build in terms of building that bottom up economy so that we're no longer talking about wealth trickling down, but we do understand that poverty trickles up. So how do we build from the bottom so that we can, in fact, uh, move towards that Green New Deal or that Green Mountain New Deal or that Green New England New Deal? But whatever it is, we don't have any choice but to move forward in green energy. Uh, and that include that will include wind that will include solar, that will include um, many, many pieces, that will include uh, a social justice piece, that will include allowing ourselves to be led in many ways by the indigenous folks in Vermont and across the country. Uh, and it's just an essential piece of uh, a comprehensive understanding. One of the things I like about the Green New Deal as AOC uh, introduced it was that it really did grab on to uh, the needing to look at and center marginalized communities in the way we move forward. So I've talked a little bit about that with David as we and, and with Deb when we've been talking about, uh, and probably with all of you actually, uh, but when, when we've been talking about things like, you know, I often tell the story of having lost my car it, which, it, in the end of November and it was a gas guzzling, big car. I drove it literally till it died on the side of the road. Uh, and it was clear that it was going to, I was just praying it would make it a little longer. Uh, and then I had no way to get around. So transportation uh, in rural communities becomes a, an issue of isolation for people who don't have money. And then in order to get to and from work, you have to buy whatever car you can afford. There is, that's the reality of being in that situation. And then oftentimes people say, well, why don't you buy an electric vehicle? There's great $10,000 incentives. Anyone I've heard when I'm campaigning, anyone can buy an electric vehicle, which of course makes me see in my own seat because I, 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 I'm like, oh no, not anyone can buy an electric vehicle. And if we want people to have them, we're going to figure out how to, have, we're gonna have to figure out how to get them to poor people. If we want poor people to have solar panels, people experiencing poverty to have solar panels, we're gonna have to figure out how to get them to them because incentives will not do it because the money's not there in the first place to be rebated. So uh, I would love to hear uh, 
both Zariah, I mean, from everyone, but Zariah first, because you're going to be on your way out pretty soon. And then I'd love to hear from David on where we go, thinking about where we center that those marginalized communities and we get to a place where we're as close to 100%. I know we can't get to 100, uh, but as close to 100% as we can get uh, in renewable energy in Vermont and transportation. Yeah, I'm gonna skip the um, renewable energy piece for just a second and talk a little bit about um, like how we get there. And I think a powerful way that we've seen moving forward, and I'm biased because I'm a city councilor, but is local action. Um, and I think there's just more and more recognition, I think more and more organizing that's going on on a national, on a global level, but at a local scale. So things like um, the Center for People's Democracy, who's just helping, <laughs> which Tanya knows so well, um, which is really helping local, um, local candidates get elected and helping them make policy that makes sense and really helping unite, I think, really a kind of universal voice around what we can demand and what that looks like on a, um, on a city level, at a state level, and like collectively asking for the same changes. Um, because I think we've been fighting for a unified voice on we can't pay for it and um, all of these other things that just simply isn't true. And um, we've got to start locally, I think. And uh, COVID has been, a, I think, interesting or teaching moment for us in terms of how much lacking national leadership, um, we've really turned to local leadership and have empowered local leaders to make decisions that are really helping constituents in their communities, both at the state level and at the municipal level, and that they're making the decisions around like, no, wait, this doesn't make any sense. We can't do this by Easter, <laughs> like, um, and saying, really making their own rules to protect um, the voices that are very loud in their community in terms of, oh, this is, we need to be safe. Um, and I think the same thing is happening and will happen on climate change. It's like, in the US at least, at least for it looks like for the next four or five years, we're not gonna get what we want on the national level um, in a top-down way. It's just not gonna happen. It's gonna be demanding changes at a municipal level. And we've got to change to some extent our cities too. There's only so much um, the national government can do in terms of incentives and mandates. We've got to change our cities. Like if you want um, a energy system where people can, can where people can live and work um, without consuming as much energy as they are. You've got to make cities more affordable for everyone to live. You you know you can't have people forced to live 45 minutes outside of the city and commuting in if you want to have a reduced energy system. Um, so I think it again is just such a blend of um, social justice and climate justice that really ends up in, I think, local action, because we've got to change the way our cities look, we've got to change the way we move people in and out of cities to get even at the baseline. And some of that's going to have to be incentivized and funded by the federal government, but some of it's just not. And I really see um, movements like Sunrise calling for that change and making it equitable and um, very local. So I think there's so much action that we can do in Vermont, you know, forget the national government if we have to for the next five years. And then when we've all done it at the state level in five years, um, make sure that we take over the whole country. Brenda, you're muted. I unmuted, but it didn't unmute with me. Uh, so uh, I think that we we have to uh, consider, you know, there's this certain senator from Vermont who often says that change does not happen from the top down. It happens from the bottom on up. And when we hear him saying that for the last 20 years, you know, I, I started interning in his office. When we hear when we hear him saying that, uh, we need to really hear it. I mean, I, I feel like this is part of the fight is you have to be engaged in whatever way you can. We talk about this nearly on every panel, whether it's if you can only be home and you can't be in the state house, that's okay. There is work that you can do. If you can't leave your house for whatever reason, there is work 
maybe COVID-19, maybe other reasons in the future, there is work that you can do. And if you only have 15 minutes twice a week, there is work that you can do. And so really realizing that there is some way for all of us to engage and be part of this conversation and uh, be part of making change. And it really happens from our local governments and those of us that do live in rural communities in part because I think I probably moved out here because um, it was cheaper, less expensive. However, I think I like love it here and I don't actually want to leave my the community I'm in, but there's also a lot that can be done from home we're finding out right now. And there's a lot that can be done within the community, but that's gonna include part of that environmental st structural change is going to include uh, you know, broadband to every household and all of that work that, that I think we are, you know, not every Vermonter. I mean, in my house, there's one computer that works with Zoom and we can't be on anything else at the same time because, and, and if we actually want to have a stable environment or a cleaner environment, or if we wanna move forward on climate cha justice or change or any kind of social justice, then we have to include all of those aspects. So I appreciate all that you're saying and I am gonna stop rambling and <laughs> see Emily and let David uh, talk a little bit about those same questions I was asking before. Uh, okay, um, well, <laughs> What we've done over the last uh, 100 years is we built a modern society based on oil and the automobile. I do not believe we are gonna survive this change if we keep doubling down on the automobile. And even though I own an electric car, the electric car is not the solution. It doesn't fix things. Uh, it just keeps us doing the same development, building parking garage, and living basically everywhere besides where you should live. So basically in Vermont, we have a chance to relocalize. We should be building up our, our towns and our small cities and make it so that people want to live in Montpelier um, and not commute to work every day. Because right now, Montpelier is a commuter city. More people show up every day than live there which is exactly wrong. And the reason I say this, the electric car is a promise that we can do what we've always done. It's just going to be powered in a little different way, but it doesn't work. It turns out a modern electric car only decreases the carbon uh, in its life cycle about 20%. So if we took every car in Vermont, uh, basically around 600,000 cars and electrified them. Our transportation emissions and carbon and basically uh, fossil fuel consumption is almost 50%. Oh, we get to reduce that to 40%. And then we all jump up and down and say, hey, we've been successful. I said, no, you aren't. You, you haven't done anything. And But this goes to people and their desires and wants to tell folks you are not going to be driving a car 20 years from now. You are going to uh, live in a smaller town or a city with higher density. You're going to have a mass transit that works um, because that, that is really what we have to do in this finite world. And it's really interesting in Vermont because in the, what, the late 60s, early 70s, we passed Act 250. And looking back at it, Act 250 did one important thing to Vermont it drove people to live in the Netherland sticks because of the 10 acre lot exemption. And that has to be fixed. Um, and we have to relocalize. It turns out, you know, I've, I've invested a bunch of money in trains, but the administration doesn't want trains. Uh, they double down on highways and bridges and all that and wasting tons of money. But it, it turns out 80% of Vermonters still live within one mile of a railroad track. And Vermont has preserved most of its railroad tracks and haven't given them up like other states. Uh, New Hampshire, you can't get from White River Junction to Concord. There used to be a railroad track there. They tore it all up and it's all gone. Uh, and the right of way is, we think is gone. So you can't do those things. Luckily, we are going to go back. I call it back to the future that we're going to go back to how we settled Vermont. 
it was along the rivers and then the railroads put the tracks along the rivers and connected everything. That's where we're going to, that's what we're going to do again. But it requires a different vision. If we keep trying to do what we've always done for the last hundred years, uh, we fail. And, you know, you, some people say, well, what's it going to cost? I did a rough calculation of what it's going to cost to convert to renewables for an electricity-based energy system. Uh, and uh, how do we relocalize and cut our energy use? It's going to cost us about $30 billion, you know, plus or minus five or 10, I'm not sure. But it's an investment that nobody even wants to think about. But we're going to end up spending a ton more money than that if we keep going uh, the way we're going. So it's a fundamental change that uh, we humans as smart people can see ahead, but we're not willing to change until something kicks us like the virus. Yes. And that, I think that's what happened. And I think that's the other thing piece we're seeing is that we can have behavior change. So, uh, and we, we've seen that very uh, clearly right now. I mean, we, we are having, we, there is a little kickback happening right now as there's the, the turn of the spigot, as Governor Scott says, people are like, Ooh, I can leave my house, which is not what he said. Just so, just in case people are watching, he did not say leave your house and go do whatever you want right now. And I am just hearing uh, the, about some, uh, kids in my son's class who are out and and hanging out together. And it's making me very nervous because I don't want to be home for the rest of my, you know, for, for the next two years or so. So I would love it if we found a way to, uh, to really self-regulate some. Uh, and I think that we have to talk about that we just want, we did all just change our behavior and nobody is asking us to, it is a drastic change, but nobody is asking us to never leave our houses and never see our friends and not see our family members, but where we can make big change and there, and very quickly, there has been be positive benefit to the climate as a result. And when we see that, um, I have actually had tears in my eyes reading some of those articles because to me, it's, it, it looks so, not that it's simple, this has not been simple, but it's so simple <laughs> that we need to be doing this. It is so clear. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I've been for the last three years talking about transforming our transportation system and making sure that we are creating an interconnected bus route, uh, e even before we're maybe able to have electric buses, but we have to connect the buses and then we would like to bring trains back and have interconnect the buses and bring trains back and have a universal transportation pass or universal bus pass so that people can choose to use that. And I think people will, especially when you start to realize that you can do your work while you're, or you can do your work or watch a Netflix or do whatever you want while you're actually in transit. Uh, it's, it's quite nice. I was doing it 20 years ago, not with Wi-Fi. It was a different scenario, but, uh, but in going from Baltimore to DC interning. And I think that we, we don't always realize that there is a lot of positive benefit, but on top, on top of that, um, we're leaving behind people who don't have the resources to get around right now. And free public transportation allows us to, is, is a really strong step uh, and an interconnected transportation. I mean, in Addison County, there's enough buses, there's enough different private companies that if you actually rerouted it, you could go, you could go to almost every house in Addison County. It is, it's quite something that so my, big parts of it are missing. So in that, in that route. And uh, here I have buses that go uh, the other direction to Mount Snow. I have buses that go uh, a different direction to Stratton, but I do not have a bus that goes through Newfane and Townsend. That's absurd. In Putney, in, I'm just talking about Southern Vermont, but in Putney, they uh, there's a bus that goes at really weird random times that wouldn't that wouldn't get you to work, so people can't use it. Uh, it wouldn't get you work or home from work, or it might get you one or the other, but not back. Uh, and so people choose to instead drive uh, if they can, or they get isolated at home. And so 
again, we are up against that social justice meets environmental justice issue. Uh, and we really need to get to a place where we do better in terms of uh, in terms of transportation. And it's so disappointing. You know, I think we, Governor Scott is doing a great job with this right now, but uh, ish, and but but there's some things right now that are coming to light with the prisons. There's some things that are coming to right, light in different aspects in terms of having a real people's bailout. We're starting to hear some of that gaslighting about what we're not going to be able to do because of this. Uh, and uh, we have to remember that there was a lot that got vetoed that would have changed the impact on families across Vermont uh, in during Governor Scott's time. And so while it may not be popular to say that out loud, I think we have to if we want to start to make these changes. And right now I'm seeing that the Global Warming Solutions Act, uh, that they're trying to preserve some of that legislation uh, because there is pushback on, on getting it through right now. I think that we want to do what we can to preserve that legislation. I watched the bill that was, uh, I'm forgetting the number, but the bill that was to uh, ban fossil, more fossil fuel infrastructure, I'm pretty sure just sat on the wall this year and didn't move and you know probably would have died anyways with COVID-19, but still seeing things move is really important in terms of also our understanding of how things, how, how to move forward on these issues. Uh, so we put those bills up if people want to look at them uh, and and see what they were about, see what they are about, and see if you might want to. Um, the fossil fuel infrastructure one is dead because it didn't make it to crossover. But the Global Warming Solutions Act, we need to we need to figure out what we're preserving about climate change um, in this year's legislative session and say it's just as important as everything else we're doing right now. Um, I'm gonna let other if anyone else wants to jump in. Please do. Oh, we, I see that Marta Hammond has a question and we're going to let her jump in and ask that question before Zariah goes. She's got to go in a minute. So come on in, Zer Marta. Just wait a minute. They'll get you in there. Welcome, Marta. You can unmute yourself and if you want you can turn on your camera we'd love to see everyone anyone's face that's willing hi there hi. um so one of the things that i i am from columbia south america and i was bright i was transplanted here in 81 by an american family and one of the things that i i uh like this coronavirus um weakening and one of the great things about living in america i it's that it has a lot to offer but sometimes I feel that it has too much to offer. Like, you know, um, for example, everything's about making money. So the bus routes, I think it's great that they have a lot of bus routes to offer. Um, I live on Center Circle. I have a business, a home daycare. And a lot of my clients can't make it here. A lot of people who are in the lower spectrum of earning income um, because the bus only goes to North Avenue. So like you were saying, the route, I mean, what, what, why is it so affected if the bus can make it down here for pickup students, you know, for school, for, to take them up to Burlington High School and stuff, why can't the bus come down here? It's a neighborhood. It's a whole route. Most of the neighborhoods do a circle. Why is it so, you know, um, you can have one more bus running so that they can do, you know, it can go around more. And then you, there, therefore you have more people working less cars on the road, I uh, more people could be going shopping downtown, the parking is an issue, you know, I, I just feel like if that, if the city provides more buses, and then they lose money in parking meters, and I just feel like everything, you know, but if we invest more in the, in the bus system, I believe that overall, the actually, everything will, will, will go better, because more people are able to go out, don't have to worry about, you know, parking. Um, I actually, one day I took my daycare children downtown on a bus. Children have never ridden a bus. And it was like the biggest, coolest thing to do, look at the window. And, you know, it was like a very exciting thing. Also the solar panels. I have solar panels in my house, but I can't afford them. I did the, when the solar city was out, I did the 15 year renting my roof, you know, they get gas and I, 
I think that that if you know they don't give you a lot, but I'm my my electric bill definitely is lower. I'm not paying a lot. You know, I have children with allergies, so I have to have air conditioning. Unfortunately, not good. But I can't have a fan because they have allergies. So I mean, I I do feel that you know I have family visiting from Vermont. They love it um, because it reminds us of back home where it's more country. Um, and they think, you know, Vermont is the most beautiful state to live in. And I mind you that they've never seen snow until they came here and they love it. And I was just like, Are you crazy? You like the cold? They're like, no, we don't like the cold. We like the fresh air. We like, like right now they're in Bogota, the capital of Colombia and they, their, their, their version of going on is opening the window and they can't, you know, to get fresh air where I have a, you know, a little bit of a backyard here and I can go sit out there and they're like, wow, you can do that. You can walk around your neighborhood. We can't do that right now. So I do think that, you know, rebuilding the homes, I think, uh, I, I can't believe how much um, building permits are be giving out now. Um, you know, you go over by Patchen Road behind there where the Ireland thing, I mean, that, that has become its own little village. Uh, Williston, what happened to Williston? Williston, the whole area, I used to work there and there by Route 2A, you know, where Walmart came in now the whole area right there across friendlies I mean it's like you don't understand what makes Vermont beautiful is you know the green the natural sources and uh, one of the things when I was growing up here I I used to bike to Colchester McDonald's when it was my first job because there was no buses to go there so I think that I think that definitely working with the bus system is a big step for you know, for the, uh, for the communities, for like my family coming here say, without a car, you can't do anything in Vermont because without a car, you, you're not mobile. You can't go anywhere. You can't, you know, and I think that if you have more buses running, you know, like do go on one, you know, in the route instead of having one every half hour, I think that if it just keep going, you know, overall, it's going to, it's going to increase, you know, the market shopping is going to increase, you know, more people moving because they, especially from New York, who don't have cars, they know like students, you you know, we have a big number of colleges here in Vermont. So I, I just, anyway, I'm rambling, but I really think that that is a big part uh, of, 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 you know, the fact that, I mean, I used to take the bus all the time and now people are like, they're like, what, you've never been on a bus? What are you talking about? Yeah. It's just kind of isolate when it's just, I think, Technology moved fast, but I think that we moved too fast in such a short time. I mean, the TV came out in the 60s, and it's not even 40 years, you know, not even so long ago, and we're, like, in cyberspace now. You know, it's crazy. I mean, it's good, but it's bad. Yeah, I think that that's true, and I think that that's been huge. I want to give, um, I think that in, it moved so fast, it skipped some steps, is what I think happened, uh, <laughs> and... So I want to give Zari a chance to answer you. And then I actually want to let Tanya give, have a chance. And that's also, um, she's very familiar with these areas as well. And so I want to give Zari and Tanya a chance to answer or talk a little bit. And then we will, do you want to be put back where you were or you want to stay? Yes. Okay. So we're going to put Marta back and we're going to talk. We're going to, bye Marta. Thank you for answering the question live. Uh, and Zariah will, uh, or asking a question live and Zariah will answer your question. Thank you. Yeah, um, and I'll also kind of use this to wrap up my closing statement. Um, I think it's amazing in the US, um, and I love Brenda's term of gaslighting, but it's like what we expect to pay for itself and what we don't expect to pay for itself. So public transit is one of those things where we keep so often the economics do work out and that's great, but it's also just weird that we think that they have to, but we don't think that the on road parking that's in nice neighborhoods needs to pay for itself or any of those other, there's just so many things where anytime we're like, oh, this would actually be really nice. And it's like, oh, you can't do that because actually that would take like 1% of whatever's budget. And it's like, we don't, we don't even, we shouldn't have to meet the standard of can this pay for itself given that anytime the military wants to buy a new F-35, we're like, how are you gonna pay for that? Nobody says that. Um, so, I, yeah, I agree that oftentimes we try to e economize and make money on things that one would pay for itself if we gave them a chance and we really invested in them. And even if they don't, that's also okay because that's the point of a government is to provide these services collectively so that we can all enjoy them. 
Um, so, and I think that's especially true for um, public transit. And then another thing I wanna to speak to, cause I think it came up a few times um, is both localizing and then this urban and rural divide, which I think matters a lot, especially on um, state. And I feel like I hear a lot of state candidates and state politicians in Vermont talk about it. I grew up um, for the latter half of my childhood in rural Oklahoma. So I think I also have, um, that's also an issue that's dear to my heart. And I think part of the reason everything is so, it's like we've created this divide that shouldn't be there. If we had food systems that worked and if we had political systems that worked and if we had lives that were oriented in our community, we wouldn't have this rural urban divide. It's like, if you lived and I spent the first half of my life in Germany and if you left your community, the fields around you would just be agriculture and they would, and if you went to the grocery store and 90 of the things you bought, 90% of the things you bought would have been made in Germany. And Germany is not the perfect country, but it's insane to me that the US does not have that system. And why are our farmers struggling when we have plenty of like, when we have food systems that could sustain us and so few of the produce that we eat comes from here? Why are they dependent on global markets when they should be dependent on us and we fail if they fail? Um, so th I definitely feel like we need to relocalize both our food system, our politics. Um, when I was running a few months ago, um, I was the only candidate who went and knocked on lower income households, which was extremely frustrating to me. Like it helped me win the election, but it shouldn't have happened. Like that's just not how we should be running our political system. And it also shouldn't be true that only 20% of the population votes. We need to demand change in terms of our food system. We need to demand it in our politics. The way that we do that is by voting um, and also by volunteering. Um, volunteer for Brenda's campaign, volunteer for Tanya's campaign. I did not have the most sophisticated campaign team or the most experienced. Most of them were brand new, as was I, to politics. I'm not a political operative by nature. This is new to me as well. But if you have people behind you and you have the volunteers, I had the biggest volunteer team of probably any election that's ever happened. So it's important that we all do something, even if it's just the 30 minute call like Brenda was talking about. And then our lives, you know, Brenda said, I like living out here. Um, that's great. But like you said, you shouldn't have to commute to Montpelier every day then to get a job. You should be able to get a job in your community and they really should feel like communities. It shouldn't be that you have 10 acres for a tax break. Um, so we really do need to re-incentivize our systems and I think really localize them in every way. That'll be my sign off statement. I think that'll be the ultimate climate change. I know I didn't say that word, but I think doing those three things will really help solve our climate crisis. Thank you so much, Zariya. And we'll also send you the end notes, but thanks for coming um, on and thanks for sharing all that with us. And I think that's exactly, you know. Thanks for having me, great panel. Thanks, we'll let you get off. I'll let you get off comfortably and then I'll continue. <laughs> so, uh, so I think that there is a, it's absolutely the truth. If you live down in Southern Vermont uh, or you live in, uh, in the Northeast Kingdom, your opportunity is deeply limited in terms of what you can make economically. So there are a lot of people commuting long distances to places like Montpelier, to sometimes to, um, to White River Junction area, to, uh, to Burlington, to Chittenden County, uh, so that they can make money or, working two, three, four jobs and running all around constantly. I mean, I've definitely done that in my lifetime, uh, running around constantly and really uh, unable to make some of those changes that really need to be made. And so I do think that that's true. And I wanna just commiserate with Jariah in that uh, I tend to be the candidate that spends a lot of time talking to people as a low-income single mom who spends a lot of time talking to low income people and marginalized groups and that is not okay there should never be a reality where the people that the only people that you're speaking to are uh either people that can donate or people that uh people that you feel have power because the power is with people and if we want to see these changes we we have to engage the electorate that is currently not engaged and so win or lose that has to be part of our fight because if we if not we're not getting the changes that we want 
and need. So Tanya, I would love you to take up Marta's question as well, because you know the area and I sent you a private message during this saying that asking you if you could talk about these areas a little bit. Yeah, I absolutely can. Uh, you know, I live in Essex and um, I, you know, Brenda, I too was really dismayed in 2018 knocking doors in places that had never spoken to a candidate that didn't even know who their representative was and that representative had been in that seat for 17 years. And, you know, I live in a community where nobody ever comes and knocks on my door. And that's, so that's my community. And so I really, that I feel that really deeply that, that we're leaving people behind because we don't think their voice matters. And that's so much of what we're talking about. Marta, I so agree with you that we have to invest in, in public transportation. I grew up in Vermont. I went to Essex High School. I remember spending summers on great grandma's farm in Jericho. And I don't mean the factory farms that we think of when we think of farms, but I mean her personal farm where she had a couple of cows and a couple of horses and a tiny little apple orchard, and she sustainably fed her family. And Sometimes she offered extra this or extra that to the neighbors or made trades of what she had extra for the things she needed, but it was a very different, very localized community. And I, I deeply believe that for so many reasons, not the least of which, of course, is climate change, but also for, for the connection that we have to reinvest in our communities. I think so many of the issues that we're seeing are issues of lack of connection in community and you know our technology has moved along very quickly and we have latched onto this view of rugged individualism you're in it on your own pull yourself up by your bootstraps and it's not real you know we have to come together and we have to support each other as as a community and we all need help sometimes I, this covid crisis has laid bare how much that is true and one of the most heartbreaking things for me you know i've, I've led some mutual aid efforts in my community and one of the most heartbreaking things for me is when someone reaches out and spends the first half of their email or phone call apologizing for asking help and or saying that they don't mean to whine or they're feeling guilty because they need to ask for help when the reality is is we all need help sometimes and in many instances people who are generally doing okay have the individual connections to ask for help without having to put themselves out there in a way that feels vulnerable and like they're being laid bare. And the people that have been cast aside and shoved to the bottom don't have those connections. They don't have the connections to someone who can help or can, even if it's to help explain. And I think that that's what we see in our electoral system as well. You know, when I think of my most privileged white friends, they generally have at least one person they know that can talk to them about politics or elections. When I think of the communities left behind by the people knocking doors, they don't. They don't know how the system works and they don't know who to talk to and they don't know where to get information. And I got a little off track because this, this issue of representation is so important to me. When I think about public transportation, like I said, it's about building community, but it's also about finding ways to use that technology collectively. I too have a dream of utilizing all of the Vermont rail to build sustainable high-speed rail. Other countries have done it and there's no reason that we can't. And you know, David, you brought up that most Vermonters live within a mile of of some sort of rail system. I'm in Essex Junction. I'm I've, I've got rail all around me. Those trains come through all the time, and I have a dream of high seat speed sustainable rail because I think that that is a way that we can come together. I nothing made me happier. I went to college in Boston where I I double majored in biology and psychology, so I've got a little bit of this science knowledge and some public health knowledge too, which leads me to know that this COVID crisis isn't the last pandemic if we keep moving forward the way we are with climate change. We're gonna see more and more and more of this as novel things defrost from the permafrost. And so I, I really think that we have to think about that as well. But nothing made me happier than living in Boston for six years, not needing to have a car and being able to hop on the subway, which isn't perfect, and get anywhere I needed to go pretty quickly in most instances. And certainly there's a lot to be built on there, but I came back to Vermont wondering, I came back to Vermont from college having to buy a car and having to figure out how am I gonna commute? I actually lived in Montpelier and commuted to Burlington because I couldn't afford to live in Chittenden County. And so I chose to do the opposite. I lived in Montpelier and commuted back into, into Chittenden County. But the reality of it was, is that if there was more than 
the one off, like, okay, if you want to go to Chittenden County from up here, you're, here's your one option. And we had regularly running high speed sustainable rail, we would open up a world of opportunity and not just climate change, but economic opportunity. We would suddenly open the door for people to be able to just engage in their communities and in the economy in ways that right now they can't because Vermont is a really hard place to live if you don't have transportation, even in Chittenden County. You know, if I want, I like I said, I work as a social worker and a lot of times I find myself in a day jumping from someone's home to school, to my office, to all over the place. And the reality of it is, is my job would be impossible relying on the current public transportation system because for me to get from my house to Burlington takes over an hour if I'm lucky. And that doesn't work when I'm trying to see eight people in a day and jump from a house to a school to doing some grocery shopping to supporting someone to navigate a job. It, it doesn't work. And so we have to build better systems that allow for the type of economic independence and community engagement that we are all dreaming of that builds that green sustainable economy. And you're also right, we are developing. I remember when Williston was primarily farmland. I remember being in high school when that Walmart went in and people were mad. And I lived in Williston when I first moved back to Chittenden County and we left because what used to be a beautiful view of, of the mountains became a view into my, my neighbor's window because the high rises, or the apartment buildings were just going up one after the next. And it's, I am all for affordable housing. I am. I, I've worked in supporting individuals experiencing homelessness for a lot of my life, but we have to think about how we're doing it and we have to use it as an opportunity. If we're going to build housing, it should be green, sustainable housing. It shouldn't be more housing engaging in building more fossil fuel infrastructure that's slapped up quickly to make a profit and is going to fall down in a couple of years. The first apartment that we lived, my, my husband and I lived in, in Williston, was brand new when we moved in. And when we moved out 15 months later, the walls were buckling because it was built so quickly just to make a profit. And we could feel the wind coming through our windows and it was brand new. Like we, we just, we have to do better. And the reality is, is the money is there. We'll invest in corporations and in pipelines and in F-35s, but we won't invest in our people and, and our planet and our, our economy. The reality is, is what's missing is the political will, and we can change that. Yeah, I want to just say that I think that political will is absolutely what's missing. I mean, we, uh, it, it, the scarcity myth is a myth. Uh, we obviously have the money when we need to do a, bail, a corporate bailout. We obviously have the money when we want to go to war. Uh, but the only time we seem to not have the money is when we need to do a people's bailout or when we need to make environmental changes uh, or uh, all kinds of small support like that. And I think that that's ex exceptionally important uh, and, uh, and spot on. And when we're talking about things like housing first, again, like you said, we need to be figuring out how we, how we build forward, not just that we do. Um, we have a, uh, from Cheryl Van Epps on Facebook, we have a question that I'm gonna throw to David. Uh, I It says, I feel like our villages are becoming New Jersey suburbs and uh, there's still dead, we still have dead spots for cell phones. So um, <laughs> that kind of infrastructure. And I also just wanna say that um, I absolutely have a dream for high-speed rail. <laughs> Uh, and I think my first knowledge of David uh, was actually about his, uh, he's known, he's quite known for trains. So, <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, uh, let, let, let's talk about our, our towns and suburbs. Uh, James Howard Kunstler uh, has uh, written books about suburbia and how it's the biggest uh, misallocation of resources we have ever done in the modern world. Uh, suburbia was based on the car. And suburbia doesn't work uh, if you take away the car. Um, and, and when I decided to buy these rail cars out of Dallas, Texas, uh, I bought 12 cars at uh, basically pennies on the dollar of what uh, a self-powered uh, rail car uh, could be bought for. Right now, you can't buy them in the United States. Only Europe uh, sells them, but they're like $10 million a piece. Very expensive. But they're using them. They have a rail system that works. They've invested in it. But going back to our towns, uh, 
we in Vermont made a huge mistake in consolidating our schools and destroying the elementary school in small towns. The elementary school, along with the train station, along with the hardware store and the grocery store, are your key things to keep people in town. As soon as you take all those away, you no longer have a community. And that's what has to be coming back. So I've named my rail effort Community Rail. It turns out in the UK, they have a community rail system. And it interfaces to the longer distance rail and then the, the commuter rail that goes into the cities. And it's tens of thousands of volunteers make the rural rail system connect under community rail. I want community rail working again in Vermont. That means St. Albans, uh, Milton, uh, Essex Junction, uh, Burlington, uh, Waterbury, Middlesex, Montpelier, all the way down to uh, Brattleboro. We can make this work. It's just that we have an administration that is doubled down and only believes in cars. So when, you're, when our governor understands driving around in circles on a weekend, looking out of the rear view mirror as his way of transportation, it's really sad. So what we're doing in our transportation budget, almost a half a billion dollars a year spent, 80% of it's for the car. The car is heavily subsidized. And then the point a number of you were making before was, oh, mass transit or public transit has to pay for itself. Are you kidding? No, you, 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 you go and change the system. I would like to see an integrated transportation uh, uh, authority for the whole state of Vermont, not Green Mountain Transit just for Chittenden County, and then a, another little bus company in Ludlow and another bus company in Rutland and Middlebury. So no, integrate this whole thing, have one authority that runs it all, and now you can integrate bus, rail, walking, biking, everything together. And it will work if you integrate and have it reliable and clean and on time. I've never been to Switzerland, but a friend went to Switzerland and said, you want to see a system that works. They have a system that works. And you know the Swiss, they're always on time. And he came back and he said, uh, uh, he said, you know what? We were going to this little mountain village. We were on the train all of a sudden. And then we got off and got a bus. But the bus stopped outside of town for two minutes. And he, I said, well, what the heck was that about? He says, they were early. They weren't on time. <laughs> so we, we don't have a system that works that way. You ever ride Amtrak? Has it ever been on time? No. <laughs> Nothing is on time. So we, we, we have uh, uh, things that we have to do here. And uh, uh, we can do it in Vermont if we just change where we uh, uh, put, our, put our money and redirect things away from the car and, and think in a little bigger way. Because we have smart people, but they aren't thinking broad enough and they aren't questioning things and we have to reset. I often find myself asking the question, like when, when this happens in Washington, we say that it's, uh, that it's a big money issue. And I'm often like, is there big money coming into these legislators? Why, why are we doing the same thing here? We don't have, we do not have that same barrier. Uh, even if like, there's all kinds of po politics involved when you're in Washington, there also is here in Vermont. But we, I think some of it is that we, the people don't necessarily know that, that we aren't as progressive as we say we are and that we aren't making the changes that we need, want and need to make. Uh, and so that is part of this engagement process, but Yes, I mean we we do have the money because we will spend it on things that uh, we don't that we don't necessarily need to spend it on, uh, and so we have it's it's about the will. So I do want to say that I also want to bring Chuck in because Chuck seems to have a question, uh, and it, if he doesn't want if you don't want to come in, Chuck, you can always put in the chat that you don't. But we'll bring you in anyways for now. Takes a second. Here he comes. <laughs> when you were looking at the attendees, they like pop up. Uh, so if you uh, take yourself off mute and you can turn on your camera, we would love to see your face. Perfect. 
There we go. Yep. Am I on? You are on. Your camera isn't on, but if you if you don't want it on, that's okay. You can just ask. That's your... fine. Okay. Um, I'm a, I'm known as the train guy around here, and I've been a volunteer uh, agent down at uh, White River Junction Depot. And I have to disagree with David about one thing. Uh, Vermonters is usually pretty close to on time. <laughs> In fact, that when I first started, they sometimes had to wait because they got here early. But that's neither here nor there. The question that I think I keep hearing about high-speed rail, and the, the question I think we need to do, ask, do we really want to be two hours from New York City or three hours from New York City? And my concern about that is I do not want to be Westchester County North. I'm perfectly happy because if we if we are three hours from New York City, people are going to move up here. It's already happening. Um, if, so I would I'm perfectly happy with 79 miles an hour. I'd be perfectly happy if they would just join at uh, Springfield with a Lakeshore Limited, so I could get out of here easily without having to stay overnight. Um, I travel by train a lot. I have an Amtrak credit card, a wonderful way to travel. Uh, but we need to think about this uh, high-speed rail because if, if it really became really convenient to be up here, we'd be like Fairfield County, C Connecticut. And I'm not sure I want to be that. That's my point. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, uh, respond to Chuck. Um, I'm not a believer that uh, the United States uh, can do much high-speed rail because of our land use and our issues of intimate domain. Uh, the Chinese put in 18,000 miles of high-speed rail. Well, they could do it for a reason. They just said, you're out of here. We're coming through with a train. Um, what we do need is what I call medium speed rail. And that's what Chuck was talking about. There, there's no reason we can't go 79 miles an hour down these welded rail tracks that we have. Um, and that's all we need. Uh, when I said Amtrak isn't on time a lot, I'm not always commenting on the Vermont uh, system because uh, our trains in Vermont have very low density and very low amount of freight that runs on the rail and they have to share, Amtrak has to share, passengers have to share the track. So we have very a limited amount. But if you travel across the US, the freight trains will stop Amtrak on sidings and they get many hours late. Uh, because we in the United States, most of the rail track in the, in the United States is 90% owned by the freight companies. By law, because they get federal money, they have to allow passenger and Amtrak on it. Do they have to be nice about it? No. Do they force Amtrak to stop and go on a siding so a freight can go through? Yes. Europe is a totally different. They have 90% of their rail is passenger and freight uh, has the limited use. So they're told to wait. So that's why their system works because it's, it's a passenger based rail system, not a freight based. So we're battling in Vermont, trying to get my 12 bud cars on the train tracks. Well, legally, uh, the rail companies that own those tracks, they have now uh, benefited to over $100 million of upgrades to their tracks that they own, but they have to allow passenger traffic on it. Do they have to be nice about it? No. Uh, do they charge you Amtrak or whoever wants to run on the rails? A lot of money, yeah, like three times normal. Um, but we in Vermont, if we had a governor uh, in our uh, congressional delegation at the federal level, took out the big club and went after these railroad companies and said, you are going to be nice and allow us to run these cars on your track. It could be done, but nobody wants to force the issue. And that has to change. And, um, you know, uh, I, I don't have any faith that the present administration is going to do anything because their V-Trans people are all in sort of uh, bed with the railroad companies trying to keep them running freight. But uh, I believe I can outlast the governor um, and someday this will change. And I hope it's really soon.
I'm sure you're aware that when Amtrak was created, it was seen as a way of getting rid of passenger trains. Oh, and yeah. Much, and much to everybody's surprise, people wrote it. And they keep writing it in greater numbers every year. Even trains like the Empire Builder and Lakeshore Limited and the ones I'm familiar with. Um, because it's a very nice way to travel. Uh, and the Republicans have some, um, can't think of his name, uh, one of the Republican pundits said that trains encourage collectivism, and he's against that. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's just incredible, the mindset you're talking about. And I agree with you completely. If we can get 79 miles an hour all the way to Montreal, that would be really helpful and probably as far as we need to go. And I would really like it if we'd find a way to use those RDCs you bought. Oh yeah, I'm still waiting. Uh, we're getting them all fixed up up in Barrie. It's just that, uh, you know, I, I, I bought them hoping that uh, we would have some leadership in Vermont that would put them to use, but uh, so far, no go. Boy, one place we could use them is from Newport down to White River Junction. Uh, when I was volunteer, when I was volunteer uh, caretaker down at the depot, we got a lot of riders from up there. And I think we need some sort of connecting service. Well, the amazing thing, the history of the, the Bud car, the self-powered rail car, uh, they used to, the Boston and Maine Railroad had the largest fleet of the 400 ever made uh, coming out of Boston in the area, they used to run a double car set up to uh, a White River Junction and split. I think one went up to Newport and the other one went to Montreal. And these things are versatile, rugged, uh, simple technology. You know, uh, and what the state just did, uh, we tried to, uh, we want to put them to use between Barry and Montpelier. It's only eight miles. <gasps> So the legislature uh, asked VTrans to do a study of what it would take. They came out with a gold-plated study of $96 million of fix-it jobs, including tearing up uh, the, ro the rail bed down two and a half feet and totally replacing everything with welded rail. All we need is 30 miles per hour for that eight-mile run. I estimated for less than $9 million, we could fix that rail and be running. But the reason they hired the consultant to go and plate it is they didn't want it. So that's typically what happens with the V-Trans organization driven by the governor. So I am, uh, Chuck, if that's if that was your last question, then we're going to put you back. Is that OK with you? Yeah. OK, great. Uh, thanks for your question. It was an excellent conversation. And I want to just say that I'm on the um, public transit advisory mission i believe is what the I, the c keeps i keep getting wrong but uh the ptac i sit on cove's uh seat on it and uh i we have some good conversations every quarter but i don't i well, mostly what we're, we're just being told information and having a little less i uh, i think advisory of a of an advisory role for the most part uh and uh, i've brought up many of the the way things around transit micro transit uh busing it, i i even sat down uh, at one point with them outside of the meeting and asked if we could you know overlay a translucent ma map and uh and redesign the bus routes and see if we could get the private companies to you know i i and i could not um they told me that was not possible was not a thing we could do, and uh, and I I said you know it's essential. These are it's essential to get public transportation to people for so many reasons. And um, so we've talked a lot about transportation. And there is a question, or is that no? Maybe there isn't. I might have lost it. Um, well, if there is, someone will remind me. Uh, but Cheryl, right. Um, So I think that uh, there is uh, something, there's a couple of issues that I wanna get to uh, and we only have, and I wanna tell folks that are maybe watching um, in other 
platforms uh, that if you want do want to ask questions, if you at first thought maybe you didn't, but now you do, please do come over to Facebook. You can still join here. Uh, you can also uh, go to Progressive Insiders YouTube and just uh, so that we can offer you questions that we have. Uh, I mean, answers uh, to your questions. Uh, then I, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the pipeline that we're, uh, that I know that 350 is working very hard on uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, stopping fossil fuel infrastructure and on stopping that expansion of the pipeline, which looks like these are some positive impacts of COVID-19 that some of these things have been slowed. And so there is some time to fight. And I also would like to talk a little bit about net metering because I think as I shared with you that I had been told wrongly that, uh, that net metering had done all that it could do in Vermont. Uh, and I don't think that that's true. And so we, I wanna talk about how we get there. And then in terms of um, for folks, who are struggling, how are we working towards uh, renewable energy systems that not only are working towards climate change, but also will help them uh, as we're building them. Uh, you know, when I think about solar panels on my own home, I think that would reduce my costs if I could afford to get them in the first place, but I can't. And so how do we, how are we gonna work towards renewable energies in that way? Uh, and how do we really get, I'm asking a lot of questions. So you can go ahead and ask me, anyone who wants to answer them can go ahead and um, bring it back. But it's, these are just things I wanna to get to. How do we get to uh, a place where we do, we, how do we keep people remembering that they can stay home for several days in a row and do work from home? And how do we get businesses to remember that? Because I'm not saying that we should forever and again, never see our families or friends, but how, how do we work towards uh, th from this moment forward, carrying with us this experience, so we understand that we can use less, we can have less consumption, uh, and and that that is possible for us. We don't have to do it to this extreme, but that is possible for us. So I will. Emily has not. We haven't brought Emily in a while. We'll start with Emily, but anyone, of course, can answer any of those millions of questions I just asked. Thanks. Yeah, I love that last question just because it's so important and it's it's one of the very conflicting things that um, I'm constantly thinking about through all this is that COVID is something that should not be happening. End of sentence. Um, it's it's a tragedy and this is only the beginning of the impacts that we're seeing, but we're also weirdly seeing like good things happening, reduction of pollution and all that, like you were saying. And so um, and I think that we're seeing in, in being forced to stay at home, um, that isn't ideal for a lot of people. Um, it's bringing up a lot of um, equity issues. Um, but I think it's also for people who are, are doing okay financially and health-wise right now, um, it's an opportunity for us to reconnect with what we haven't had a connection with in a long time. And by that, I think we keep touching on this idea of community and how important that is going to be, how important that is for resilience and how important that is for us to rediscover our collective power in order to fight for the policies, you know, to get us um, renewable energy, to get us weatherization, to get us public transportation that's going to be effective because when we are only able to um, spend time in person with our families at home and when I, the only people I interact with face-to-face um, -face are my neighbors that I pass by on the sidewalk, um, those relationships end up getting stronger and I'm um, really getting to know my neighborhood better. Like personally, I'm really, I'm hiking nearby and I'm gardening more and I'm reconnecting with these things that I think are very, uh, very much a part of Vermont culture. But I think sometimes we forget about when we get caught up in the day to day. And so I think having people take this take this moment and think about it as an opportunity to reconnect with what exactly it is that um that can make this that, that can make all these things possible i think like david the the fact that came to me and I'm, I'm glad that you put it in percentages because i know this to be a fact but i didn't quite have the numbers for it the fact that we need to decrease consumption by 80 percent I can't begin to wrap my mind around that, but what that's going to look like for our lives. I know that um, 
you know, the uh, high income countries and those on the upper income brackets of those uh, countries in particular are going to have to make the most cuts. But, you know, what does that begin to look like while we um, are still figuring out on a policy level how to stop this crisis? We can be tinkering at home with, okay, what kind of systems can we build within our communities, within our um, jurisdictions, our townships, to um, increase food sovereignty, to increase our connection, our different access to education and healthcare, um, and helping each other out. And mutual aid networks, I think, are an excellent example of how that's working out. So I think just reminding each other of that and the good that can come out of this is really hard and sometimes you just go crazy being stuck at home and, and there are so many beautiful things out there, but there are also so many cool things going on here that we can focus on and really try. So yeah, that's all I have on that. Uh, I am wondering if anyone else wants to take on any one or all of those questions. Uh, be, we have a few more minutes. We will have a time to close out in a couple of minutes, uh, but just uh, wanting to make sure we get to those things as well. Well, if nobody else wants to talk, uh, let, let me address this issue of net metering. Uh, uh, the, the rest of the United States thinks that Vermont is uh, the gold standard on uh, environment, renewables, and so on. Uh, we have sunk from being the gold standard on implementing solar through net metering. I helped write the law over 10 years ago of group net metering, registration. We had the best laws in the United States. And uh, the governor uh, appointed Tony Rausman as the chair of the PUC. And between him and the utilities, they have decimated our net metering laws. Uh, solar lost jobs for the last three years. And the concept was, uh, we're going too fast implementing renewables. And so we have to throttle it back. And it, it was the utilities that drove this and it's dead wrong. And uh, we have to re-legislate the net metering that uh, we wanted to uh, basically did uh, over 10 years ago uh, in the next uh, two years, uh, because we're going down the tubes basically what the governor has done is outlawed wind power. And I'm the recipient of that. I'm the last two projects standing in the state and they've both been closed down. There's no wind going to happen under the present administration because uh, the PUC and uh, the Department of Public Service uh, has basically uh, been on a war path to make sure wind doesn't happen in Vermont. And wind is critical. Uh, it has to be about half of our renewable and uh, the other well, about 40% wind, 40% solar, uh, then we're gonna have some biomass and hydro for the rest. That's how we get there, but they don't get it. They don't have a long-term view uh, and uh, they're, they're destroying our future. I would love to go back for a moment and talk about people moving to Vermont and people moving in general. One of the things that we are already seeing and will continue to see in increasing numbers are climate migrants or climate refugees, people who are leaving areas that are now too arid to grow food or don't exist. Because I mean, if we're talking about New York as, as sea levels rise, Manhattan's not gonna exist. They're gonna have to go somewhere. And so the reality of it is, is that people are going to move because of climate change and we are all in this together. And so to turn our backs on people who are having to leave their communities being ravaged by, climate change, whether that is the increasing strength of tropical storms, whether that is the increased rainfall. I, I remember just last year, and it's tiny, but we got the amount of rain in one day in late October that we would usually get in the whole month. And it flooded into, I, we have this huge step into our house and I remember opening the door and there was six inches of water and I thought something was backed up. But the reality of it was, is that just because we got so much rain so fast that the ground couldn't absorb it. And that's happening everywhere. We're getting torrential storms after arid summers and the ground, and that's going to increase more and more and more and more. And we're going to see more people fleeing 
because where they have lived either is underwater or is no longer habitable because of climate change. And so one of the ways that we protect what we know and love about Vermont is by boldly fighting this and ensuring that we turn the tide so that not as many people have to flee where they live. So I, I think that we have to, to challenge ourselves to build strong communities that can welcome those who are fleeing because their communities don't exist or their communities no longer are habitable or are underwater, which I guess would make it uninhabitable. Um, because that's the direction that we're headed. And it's already happening in, in many places. We're seeing people having to leave because they cannot sustain life in the places that they would live. I think that it's a dangerous space to stand in to say that, because I think that, I mean, we're seeing that with, with migrants and refugees of other th things that we have, we humans have created, whether it be war or famine or broken governmental systems that we have, have helped to break. But if we create a problem, we have to stand up and, and hold space for the people that are being harmed by that to be welcomed into our communities and be taken care of and not shut out because we view them as other or different. I just, I really, I think that we are going to see more and more global migration as, as climate change progresses and to turn our backs on those people fleeing would be wrong. And, and so I just, I just want to put that out there. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. And I want to say that as a, as a state, you know, I wouldn't have, I had to throw away, throw away 28 cubic yards of belongings during tropical, after tropical storm Irene. And I, what I was left with was nothing. I had, I could fill a eighth of a, uh, the smallest U-Haul truck uh, with the things that I insisted on keeping. And I, the only things that I really worked on, on cleaning the mold off of was my son's toys. And then we stayed with my grandparents a house during that time. I lost uh, all of my subcontracted work, work that I have not gotten back because I had to clean out my house. I had to get it, the stuff out of there. Uh, and so I could not make those contracts. And, uh, and the reason that I was able to, to survive that time was because I had help and I had support. I had support from our communities. And I do think that Vermonters understand helping one another and it, we shouldn't just be helping one another in our neighborhoods. We should be welcoming people who have those similar experiences. And it is very, it is, I often describe that experience as feeling like I was floating. I had nowhere to land. And I didn't know when I would have somewhere to land. And I was by the fortune of my family living nearby uh, and having a room for my son and I to stay in, I was uh, able to uh, have somewhere to be. But it, was, it wasn't a, my, a new home, not for almost two years. I didn't have a couch for, I got a couch because someone gave it to me for free last November. Uh, I currently use a kitchen table from one of my fam, one of my grandparents that's passed away's house as a dining room table. And uh, that recovery is huge. And people come out of those experiences of climate with nothing. And so understanding that because we do know that lots of um lots of prefab homes are built in flood zones because we do know that it is the most marginalized people that are impacted to really understand that it is our responsibility as human beings because the, they are also human beings and because they are also part of our planet and our earth to that we have to lift them up as well uh, I want to ask this question from Cheryl. So I want to thank you for bringing that up, Tanya, and going back to it. Um, from Cheryl Van Epps, she said, we should look into European countries for innovative ways to decrease fossil fuel consumption. I think that's true. Uh, my two cents on that is I think that's true, but I also think we already know how to do that. And we just are not doing it. And I will say that in Vermont's government, it is so important that you help elect people to the legislature, to uh, to Lieutenant Governor's office, to the governor's office that are going to have the political will to make these changes. So that is not the only thing though. I don't want you to leave here saying, I can just 
help these people win uh, and then it'll all get better. That is not the only thing. Your job is not done then. You still, we still want you to take 15 minutes twice a week or once a week or every day or whatever you're able to do to help make these changes in your communities and across the state and across the country and across the world. So that's my two cents about that. Um, and uh, I will, who, if anyone else would like to talk about that or other issues that have come up before, we, and then I'm, we're gonna close out in just a minute. So any last comments before we all make a closing comment? Um, I just wanted to um, go off of something you just said, Brenda, about um, the work doesn't end with getting someone elected or, you know, yeah, donating to a campaign or, or putting in a couple of hours of volunteering. Um, and I wanted to go ba um, back to something that was said earlier, I forget who said it, in this talk um, that we don't know what's going to happen um, with the upcoming federal election. And so um, I think I think this was a Ryan said that, like, we need to be focusing on, you know, we need to think about, OK, what can the state of Vermont do um, if if the federal government isn't an option um, not to get too political? But I'm, I'm not liking either of our options at this point. Um, but I do think regardless of who ends up in office, we still need to fight tooth and nail. We don't have five years to wait for the next president of the United States to make a change. We, yeah, we, we don't. So come election day and come inauguration day, I'm going to be in DC. I'm going to be fighting tooth and nail for what we need as a country, because yes, we need state level changes and we need city level changes and we need changes in our households and our day parts. We need change everywhere because this is the greatest crisis that uh, human civilization has ever faced, at least I think so. So um, that's just one thing that I wanted to point out is that losing an election doesn't mean we've lost. It just means that we need to fight in different ways and creative ways and we just need to fight a little louder. I went on a soapbox about down ballot candidates um, for that reason the other day. Uh, and it was sort of, I'm seeing people be very depressed that their candidate did not win the presidential primary. And I understand that. However, like I believe in this progressive movement. I believe that we need to make climate change. I believe we can. So I'm gonna need y'all to just move forward and help fight for this progressive movement right now. Like, I need you to do that. I need you to help down ballot candidates. I need you to help if that's, if you don't want to, I need you to help with issues. I need you to be part of the movement and let go of that. If you would donate $5 every time Bernie sent you a text or every time Elizabeth Warren sent you a text, but you won't donate five, but you don't phone it, donate $5 when you get those emails from those down ballot candidates, don't just help me um, win for Lieutenant Governor or Tanya, but go into your district and find those candidates and find the people running for city council and select board who are going to make fight for these changes. That's what needs to happen. That's where we need to go with this. And so if you, if you, you would volunteer and make phone calls for hours on end for your, your preferred candidate in the presidential primary, then you should be able and willing to do that for the down ballot candidates because it is absolutely the truth that change happens from the ground on up. And so I have been, you know, I, I hear how important that is for people and I hear how much people are struggling and I totally get that. And I have some super champion volunteers, but we need more of them. And we, people are, are not just because of COVID-19, people are depressed about what's happening politically, but we can only change that if we fight for it. And so I know from having experienced so much crisis in my life that when I get, when you get knocked down, the, you have to take some deep breaths, feel your grief, and then get back up because it is the only way for us to get through it. I always think of this image of, I, I've said this in a few panels, but this dance, I run this dance festival. So this dance that happened uh, that was uh, people walking forward hand in hand and they were, not, they were knocked down over and over again and pushed back. And then they would get up again and walk forward hand in hand and then knocked out and pushed. And that's what's happening here. We only are gonna win that is true with civil rights movement, that has been true with every movement, that has been true with the women's right to vote, that has been true with every movement across our country. We're only gonna win if we're fighting to win. 
And so we have to keep getting back up. You cannot be defeated in this moment. So I am gonna let everybody say their closing statement and then I will close us out. So I will start, where did I start? I ended with David last time. I will start with David this time. <laughs> okay. Um... Well, uh, you know, as I started this, uh, we are, uh, there's an incredible book out called The Fourth Turning. You know, Strauss and Howe wrote it. They wrote it in 1998, and it predicts that uh, we go through in this country a turning every 85 years or so. The first one was Revolutionary War. Second one was Civil War. Third one was Depression, World War II. Uh, the time, 85 years from the Depression, World War II, is right now. And the, the reason I bring this up is it's the time things change dramatically. Between these turnings, you don't get a lot of change because of the generations. There's usually four uh, generations of people. Um, and by 85 years between them, uh, most of the people have died that remembered the previous stuff. So you start over. So it's hopeful, but it's also uh, scary as hell because uh, out of a turning, which we are in, I believe, right now, uh, with the present president we have in these crises that we're up against, uh, we could come out much better or much worse. And I bring this up because we, we have a lot of things to really do differently in Vermont. We have a broken criminal justice system. We have a broken education system. We have a broken health care system. We have a broken energy system. We have a broken food system. We have to do some things really different. And it requires this time of change that we're right into to uh, look ahead and get led out of it and, and uh, uh, make good use of this crisis for the right things. And, you know, I've spent, as I started, uh, I said, I've been at this business 40 years. And as I said, pushing that rock up the mountain. Well, we hit the top of the mountain and we have change coming at us like crazy. We just have to make the right decisions and where we want to go. Thank you. That is so Thanks. the truth. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go to Emily. <laughs> just Thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say to. I have no idea how many people are watching this right now or will be watching it in the future, but um, when you are watching this, no matter what is going on in your life right now, in the COVID crisis, in the climate crisis, in just the crisis of everything right now, um, you're enough. Whatever is going on is not your fault. It is the fact that we live in a world that is structured to make this happen to you. Um, whether it's family problems, healthcare problems, putting food on your table, education, whatever it is. Um, but that doesn't mean that that has to be the end of the story. And it doesn't mean that we all don't have some capacity to fight in whatever way that looks like. It could be five minutes a day, it could be five minutes a week. But as soon as you get started, you don't want to stop because it's so good. It's so good fighting for what you believe in and standing up for your values and living them and embodying them and know you're not going to be perfect and you know there will always be more work to do. But that can be the thing that keeps you from getting started or it can be the thing that keeps you going and realizing that you can think, oh, everything has to change or you can think everything gets to change. It gets to happen and we're in this really terrifying and exciting moment where we can do that, where we can be the generations that come together um, and, and fix this mess that we really um, did nothing to cause. So um, I hope that you all are safe and healthy and that you um, stay hopeful throughout all of this. Um, and I wish everyone who's watching this throughout all of this. Thank you. And I totally agree. You are enough. And it is so good. I'm hooked. I'm sure Tanya's about to say that she's hooked. We're all I'm hooked on fighting for change. And I and I can't tell you quite what it feels like. I can't describe it, but I am hooked. Here's Tanya. So we're in the middle of this global pandemic. And what that has showed us is that the majority of our people are struggling amongst the list of broken systems that David listed our economy is not okay. And it's not been okay for a long while. 
it's the other thing though that this global pandemic has shown us is that we can make bold systemic change and we can make it fast. As our climate warms, we're gonna see more and more novel pandemics and more and more of our marginalized communities suffering at higher rates than those who are right now generally doing okay. And interestingly, those who are generally doing okay are the majority of the people holding seats in these positions of power. And so they don't have as much incentive to make change. We are in a crisis right now and we've been really in a crisis for decades. As a social worker, one thing that I know is that a crisis is a moment of danger, but it's also a moment of opportunity. We've fully broken our economy now, we're really looking at it, and we have a choice. We can go back and rebuild that same broken, unjust economy that has led us to this point, or we can build something better. We're going to have to invest in our people and rebuild an economy that is thoughtful and planful about truly making investments in people and planet. And we have to do it now. We need to let go of the idea of incremental change and demand bold action, the bold action that we deserve. We have to fight for a just, green, sustainable economy, and we have to fight for it now. And the thing is, is that I know that together we can win this fight. We will win this fight. We have to win this fight. And so I really hope that you grab onto that hope and you grab onto the moment. We are at this inflection point where we, we can't go back to normal because that's gone. And we shouldn't go back to normal because that normal is what led us here. And here is not an okay place to be. And so we can grapple with, you know, we're, we're at this place where so many of these structures have completely broken down, but that gives us a beautiful opportunity to build something with a stronger foundation that is just and includes everyone. And so I hope you'll join me and all of us here in doing that, in really making sure that we lift up every voice and the people who have held deeply to this idea of giving the people crumbs that we we let them go out with this tide and we really build a movement for the people and with the people at all levels of of not just our government but at all levels of these movements it's not just about elected seats it's about lifting up the young people to continue this fight and it's about ensuring, as you said, Emily, that every person knows that whatever they have to offer is enough, but doing nothing is not an option. Yeah, uh, all of that. Uh, everyone, what everyone left us with, I'm going to have to go back and, and maybe make some statements out of all of your, <laughs> make some quotes out of all of your statements. So uh, I just want to say that we are seeing uh, wide open. Our system, our structures and our gaping holes in our system is wide open. And these problems are people made and they can be people fixed. These didn't just come out of nowhere. We can fix them together. We can build better. We can build from the bottom up. We can build in every city and town. Uh, we can make sure that we are making sustainable structural change around every one of the justice issues that we have brought up many times tonight. It is absolutely essential from now until um, until we're until we're better <laughs> and that'll probably be a long time for us to be take making those fights. And I understand a hundred percent what it is like to feel like you just can't do anything else. Uh, and, and people are asking. So offer that five minutes, offer that 10 minutes, whatever it is that you have, because it really is important to make these changes. We have to work together. We have to fight together and we have to build better. We need to have this bottom up economy. We need to be working towards building a, a bold, some bold climate action, including a Green New Deal or Green Mountain New Deal or Green New England New Deal or all of those things. Uh, we have to make sure that it's inclusive and that it is intersectional and that it 
centers the most marginalized groups when we're making these decisions. So I want to thank all of you for panelists for coming. And I want to thank everyone who attended. And sorry that we kept you a little bit late. I'd love to ask people to volunteer uh, and host community conversation for my campaign. I also would love to ask you to donate to Tanya's campaign and also to my campaign uh, for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, and if you're comfortable and able to give please do. Fundraising is very hard in the COVID-19 crisis. So if you're someone who's able to give, please give. It makes a huge difference to being able to continue this fight uh, and, uh, and being able to continue to be talking to people who are facing the problems uh, more than we are on the phone, talking to uh, donors. So I want to make sure that, that that's you know that that's my mission and I want to ask you to join us and at towards the end of this week you will see something that Tanya and I have been working on uh, and uh, we're excited to bring forth that's with candidates from across the country from every corner of the country uh, and we're really excited to bring it forth but I'm not going to tell you what it is till the end of the week so you'll have to stay tuned you can sign up for any of our mailing lists Sun I'm sure that we all have mailing lists so any of our mailing lists uh, and get updates for information. Thank you all very much. Sorry for keeping you late and I'll see you next week at COVID-19, uh, how it's how it's disproportionately impacting communities of color. Monday 7, Monday, May 4th, and it will be impacted communities that are, are the ones talk, doing the talking. I'll do a lot less talking at that event. See you all later. <laughs>